How many people are struggling to pay the rent? How many people can't pay their medical bills? How many people can't afford to buy enough groceries to feed the family? How many people are discouraged because they've either lost their homes or about or, or, or about to lose their homes? How many people make only enough money to be a slave? Nothing more. And how many people can't even find a job? How many people's lives resemble a person swimming in deep water with 100 pounds tied to their feet? And as they try to grasp for air, they can only drown in hopelessness. And in the midst of all this, how many people hear religious leaders and pastors say the following, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And that comes from Malachi 3, 8 through 9. Well, how many people have heard religious leaders and pastors quote these very words to the poor and needy, only to drive off in a fancy car to the most luxurious and expensive home? And then have to sit there and watch these men go on vacation five times a year or more, while people in the church are less than a centimeter from homelessness. Well, here at Hearing the Truth, we we not only have experienced this problem, but we're tired of it. And we're going to set the record straight on the biblical message of tithing. DS, once again, it's good to see you. Yes, Mike, the pleasure is mine, especially when we are going to deal with such an issue as this one. DS, I am sure that you're quite aware of that passage of scripture that I quoted, and I am sure that you've if you've heard it preached through the rooftops right before the pastor goes on vacation and uh, before fellow members of the church go down to the welfare office because they lost their jobs. Yes, yes, yes. And I am also aware that in most cases, the pastor will then require a 10% tithe from a single parent's welfare check along with offerings. Then the pastor and elders may tell the person to get an extra job at McDonald's so that more money can be put into the treasury of homes, new cars, and vacations. How sickening. Utterly sickening. I think the real issue is what does Malachi 3 really say and ultimately what does the Bible in its entirety say about tithing today we're going to find out where tithes come from what constituted the tithe who they were for and other issues DS if you don't mind I'd like to begin with Malachi 3 sounds good now before I get busy I want the audience to understand something you are not going to hear me tell you that Christians should not financially support ministry if no one financially supported ministry Ministry, then nothing would get done for the cause of Christ. What I will tell you is that modern tithing has become a manufactured way of peddling the word of God for sordid gain. I will tell you that the system of tithing in how it is importuned on people in most churches is not in agreement with the Bible. In this particular program, we are going to discover how the Bible balances out the issues concerning tithes and financial support for ministry. Now, I will say that I am not going to handle this situation with kid gloves out of fear that I might insult or hurt cherished beliefs among my friends as well as acquaintances to our website. I am going to deal with this problem as it should be dealt with, hard and to the point. I just ask the audience to bear with us through the whole study before passing judgment. Yes, dear. Yes, ministry must have financial support. I agree. But there are far too many clergy who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Just as you, DS, I am sick of the charlatans who are nothing more than money-mongering mammonites who twist the scriptures for dishonest gain. Yes, I think we need to set the record straight on this issue. Let's take a look at Malachi 3, verses 8 and 9. We read, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, stop here for a moment. Those texts are the text used to tell the congregation that if they don't tithe, they will be cursed. Then Malachi 3.10 is quoted as a promise of blessing. We read, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. How do the majority of Christian leaders interpret those texts. The interpretation of Malachi 3 verse 8 to 10 is as follows. Rob God of 10% of your money and you will have a curse on you. Or pay God 
and you will be blessed. Yeah, but is that really what Malachi is saying? I don't think so. Mike, I think we will spend a good deal of time here in Malachi chain referencing to other scriptures. Now, there are two things that we should immediately know. Number one, who was to receive tithe? And number two, what was the tithe? What constituted the tithe? Let's begin with number one. Who was to receive the tithe? Let's go to Numbers 18, verse 21. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. 22. Hereafter the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. 23. But the Levite shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance 24 for the tithes of the children of Israel which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord I have given to the Levites as an inheritance therefore I have said to them among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance that's pretty obvious the tithe was for the Levites because they did not receive the inheritance with the rest of Israel. Yes, it only makes sense. They were the priests who represented the Lord to all the tribes of Israel. And if they did not inherit large amounts of land with flocks and herds, it only makes sense that Israel should support the priesthood. Could anyone else receive the tithe other than Levi? No. In that covenant, only the Levite priests, the sons of Aaron, those are the only ones that could receive tithe. That's right. Now, number one, who was to receive tithe? The Levitical priesthood. And two, what was the tithe? Note this clearly. The system of tithing in Old Covenant Israel is nothing like what goes on today in the Christian world. In the Old Testament, tithes were produce, grains, the fruit of the trees, new wine and oil, and the firstborn of herds and flocks. Notice Leviticus 27, verses 30 through 33, we read, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. Now, if the people of Israel had to go to a faraway place to tithe, and the place was a long distance, such as Jerusalem, then they would exchange their goods for money. But on arrival, the money was turned back into cattle, sheep, wine, and etc. Another aspect of the tithe, according to Deuteronomy chapters 14 and 26, was that every third year the tithe was to be reserved as a festival tithe, where the Levite, the stranger, the orphan, the widow, and the poor could come and eat. So, what was tithable? Agricultural products were tithable. Products from trees, such as fruit and oils, were tithable. And animals from herds and flocks were tithable. Was money tithable? No, money was not tithable. The only reason there was money was for the convenience of the people who had to go on long trips to tithe. Money was not tithable, and it was not acceptable as a tithe at all. Now, most teachers in the Christian world hope that they never have to get to this uncomfortable place of discussion. If you manage to get this far with with most, they'll say, money was not tithed because there was either no money or a scarcity of money. That's true. But that's not the case. Well, under God's command, the Israelites were able to melt down gold along with other metals to make the furniture in the sanctuary. You would think that if God wanted an abundance of metal coins, they would have been made. Well, the question is, was there money? Of course there was. Notice Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 through 27. We read, You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. 
And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But if the journey is too long for you so that you are not able to carry the tithe or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you when the Lord your God has blessed you then you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses and you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires for oxen or sheep for wine or similar drink for whatever your heart desires you shall eat there before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice you and your household you shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates for he has no part nor inheritance with you how interesting in other words, if an Israelite had to travel a long distance with tithable things like agricultural products and animals, rather than carrying a big load, he can make an exchange for money to lessen the load. Then once he arrives at the location, he then turns the money back into the tithable commodities. What does this mean? This means that money was not tithable in the old covenant economy. And when Malachi 3 speaks of tithes, it's not talking about money. This is not hard to see. It's like you said, if God can command the creation of furniture produced by melted down metals, then he can command that money be made. Was there money? Yes. Did God want this as a tithe? No. That statement, quote, money was not tithable because there was no money, unquote, as some say. <laughs> wrong, dead wrong. There was money. It just was not too important to God. Now let's take a look at Malachi 3, verses 10 and 11. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now here, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear the fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Now question. How do modern Christian leaders interpret those verses? Let me paraphrase each verse the way they would have it. We read, Bring you all the money into the church treasury, that there may be money in the church. And prove me now here, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you great blessings of prosperity and pour you out money, that there shall not be room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devil who will steal your wealth for your sakes so that he will not destroy your prosperity, nor shall the money fail to bear fruit for you in life, says the Lord of hosts. I don't know about you all, but to me that does not sound right. But yet the modern Christian world teaches this very thing. Well, they teach a lot of things that happen to benefit themselves financially. A lot of modern day pastors today believe that that somehow preaching the word of God is you know, some sort of business which the Lord himself has given them a franchise for. Yes, yes. The congregation is their customers. Oh, yeah, that's the truth of the matter. But like you said, um, in other words, opening up the windows of heaven entails great blessings of prosperity for those who dump large amounts of money into the church. The devourer is the devil who steals prosperity. Anyway, if you dump lots of money into the church treasury, God will see to it that there is no end to the amount of money you have, which is which is a bunch of malarkey. It has nothing to do with prosperity. Oh, yeah, but like usual, Scripture is never compared with Scripture. And like usual, Malachi is taken out of its historical context. The question is, what does, quote, opening up the windows of heaven, unquote, mean? What does the, quote, devourer, unquote, mean? Let's begin with, quote, the windows of heaven, unquote. Notice Genesis 7, verses 11 and 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now, 
Look at Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Note this clearly. The opening of the windows of heaven is nothing more than rain. What is the devourer? We can sum up the meaning of both the windows of heaven and the devourer in Deuteronomy chapters 26 and 28. Deuteronomy chapters 26 and 28 lay down the law of both the blessings and the curses for Israel concerning the tithe. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 26 and 28 lay the foundation for what Malachi 3 is talking about. Exactly, Mike, exactly. Now, notice Deuteronomy 26, verses 12 through 14, we read, When you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled, then you shall say before the Lord, your God, I have removed the holy tithe from my house and also have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless and the widow, according to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning, nor have I removed any of it for an unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that you have commanded me. I can't help but notice in different scriptures that tithing was not only for the Levites, but also for the needy. Isn't it amazing that today tithes are more for the greedy than the needy? Oh yeah, that's amazing. Now let's look at Deuteronomy 28. Verse 1, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. 2, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. 3, Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. 4, Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. 5. Blessed shall be your basket and your netting bowl. Let's go down to verse 8. The Lord will command the blessings on you in your storehouses, and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. Verse 11. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods, and the fruit of your body, and the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, and the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. 12. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to, bl and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Well, that makes sense. If ancient Israel obeyed all of God's commands, including tithing, God would allow enough rain for them to grow good food and raise good livestock, which are the tithable commodities. Yes, Mike. God would open the windows of heaven, meaning the rain, so that Israel would have plenty of produce and healthy livestock for the tithe. And what was the tithe for? Deuteronomy 26.13 says, The Levites and the needy, not the greedy. Now, if Israel was not faithful to God, what would happen? The devourer would come. Notice Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. 16. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. 17. Cursed shall be your basket and your netting bowl. 18. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Go down to verse 23. And your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. 24. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. Now verse 38. You shall carry much seed out to the field, but gather little in, for the locust shall consume it. 39. You shall plant vineyards and tend them, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. 
Verse 40, you shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives shall drop off. Well, in light of all this, what does Malachi 3 really say? It's apparent that Malachi 3 verse 8 to 11 does not say any of the following. Quote, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In giving money to the church. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Unquote. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, bring ye all the money into the church treasury, that there may be money in the church. And prove me now here, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you great blessings of prosperity and pour you out money, then there shall not be room to receive it. Don't say that either. Or, and I will rebuke, rebuke the devil who will steal your wealth for your sakes, so that he will not destroy your prosperity and ruin your elaborate vacations. Nor shall the money fail to bear fruit for you in life, says the Lord of hosts. Let me repeat. Malachi 3, verse 8 to 11 does not say that. Now, I know John Hagee says it does, but d- doesn't say that. Not in Malachi. That's right, Mike. Malachi 3, 8 through 11 does not say any of that. Malachi 3, 8 through 11 says the following. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings, meaning produce and livestock. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes, meaning the produce and livestock, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And prove me now here, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, meaning rain, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer, meaning drought, famine, and pestilence, for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Note this clearly. There is a serious problem when Christendom takes specific agrarian promises under a specific covenant and transposes these agrarian promises as a justification to peddle the word of God and promise false prosperity. A serious problem. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat which is bread in mine house. Now, why does God want food in his house? Why, for the Levites, who did not receive an inheritance with the rest of Israel. It makes complete sense why the tribes would give tithes and offerings to those priests. Why does God want food in the storehouse? To help the needy. Now, in modern Christendom, this has all become upside down. Modern Christian leaders interpret Malachi 3, verses 10 as, Bring ye all the money into the church treasury, that there may be money in my house. Man, if God wanted more money in his house, then why in the world did Jesus do what he did in the house of God? Notice Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Clearly today Christendom is filled with money changers. They have not ascertained the real problems of Malachi's day when they read Malachi 3. Ben, explain what the problem was in Malachi's day. What is the problem? Both the people and the priests departed from God. Let's go to Malachi 1. Notice verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to your priest who despise my name? Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? 7. You offer defiled food on my altar, but you say, in what way have we defiled you by saying the table of the Lord is contemptible eight and when you offer the blind as sacrifice is it not evil and when you offer the lame and sick is it not evil well it sounds as if the sacrifices were contemptible before God verse 7 says that the offerings were defiled notice also verse 10 who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain I have no pleasure in you says the Lord of hosts nor will I accept an offering from your hands 
Notice Malachi 2, verses 8 and 9. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances, and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? What is the problem? The ordinances of God are not kept. And in Malachi 3, verses 8, the examples of tithes and offerings are used as an example to describe this problem. Notice in Malachi 1, 7 and 8, lame and sick animals are being offered. The best animals are not tithed. Rather, the best animals are kept back. This indicates greed. This is why Malachi 3.10 says, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Now, let us raise the question for emphasis. Why does God want food in his house? Let's go back to Deuteronomy 12 and 14 to answer this question. Notice Deuteronomy 12, 5 through 7. But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. And there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there shall, and there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your households, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. Now let's go to Deuteronomy fourteen, twenty-seven through twenty-nine. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied, that the Lord your God may bless you in all, in all the work of your hand which you do. Oh, that's not hard to see. The tithe was for the Levites who did not receive an inheritance with the rest of Israel. Israel, and the tithe was for the less fortunate. Yes, and notice James one twenty seven. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, in much of the modern Christian world, James one twenty seven could be read this way. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to take 10% and require offerings of the welfare checks and social security checks from the orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself spotted with wealth and prosperity. I got big news. There were many problems with Israel in Malachi's day, and one of those problems was greed. But greed is far worse today. All right, so let's get this straight. DS, the tithe consisted of products of the land and livestock, not money. The tithe was for the Levites, who had no inheritance with the rest of Israel. It was for families to celebrate with their creator with big feasts. The tithe was for the less fortunate, the poor. Okay, so how in the world has the Levitical system of tithing metamorphosized into what it is today in the Christian church? And what has tithing become in most churches? Well, tithing in most churches is a fee for acceptance. Tithing is for vacations. Tell it like it is. For new cars and homes. Someone may say tithing is, is for the spreading of the gospel. Well, great. When, when is the gospel going to be spread? Because the only message I seem to hear is false prosperity messages and condemnations of the poor. That's exactly right. I can't count the number of times I've been to church only to hear the pastor tell the poor that they're robbing God. Well, if the pastor is going to quote Malachi 3, 8 through 12 and emphasize that people are robbing God, if the pastor is going to be so gung-ho about saying, you are robbing robbing God, then I am going to be gung-ho about quoting Proverbs 22, verses 22 and 23, which says, Rob not the poor, because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate, for the Lord will plead with their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. 
And Mike, we should also be gung-ho about quoting Proverbs 30, verses 14 and 15, which say, There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. The leech, notice this, the leech has two daughters. Give and give. Let's read that again in verse 15. The leech has two daughters. Give and give. That is exactly what the prosperity teachers are. Leeches that say give and give, and they spoil the poor. Proverbs 22, verse 22 to 23 is right back at them. Yes, there's multitudes of poor Christians who feel dejected because they don't have the money to buy status in their churches. They're often shunned if they're not giving 10% of their income and harassed if they're not giving offerings. There's many Christians who give to the point of bankruptcy while their religious leaders are in Hawaii. Most of the time under the guise of being at religious conferences several times a year. There's many Christians who feel lost because they, they will not give 10% weekly. They feel as if they are, are buying their way into heaven. And because they don't have enough money, they're lost. How much sympathy do these poor souls get? None. Only incessant reprimand as they are told that they are cursed. Heck, we might as well go back to the Catholic sale of indulgences. When people were taught that if they give enough money to the priest, the priest could lessen a dead relative's stay in purgatory. What a joke. D.S., I'm sick and tired of the charlatans in Christendom who claim that they are to receive money tithe. They're liars. I like to see those people try to prove to me that they're the sons of Aaron. Right. Modern prosperity teachers twist Malachi into something it is not. There is no mandate in Malachi 3, 8 through 12 to dump large amounts of money into the Levitical priesthood. So how in the world can Malachi 3, 8 through 12 be a mandate for clergy today to receive large amounts of money? Uh, there is no correlation, only a perfidious man-made money system of elevating religious leaders while allowing the poor to get poorer. Notice what Paul says in Titus 1, 10 and 11. For there are many unruly vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. A moment ago I asked, how in the world has the Levitical system of tithing become what it is today in the Christian church? Well, the truth is the Levitical system of tithing has not become what we see today. What we see today is a contradistinction from the Levitical system of tithing. What we see today is both a farce and a disgrace. Yes, I've heard of poor families being kicked out of churches because they couldn't tithe regularly. What was the crime of these families? Poverty. In most cases, if people are too poor to give money to the churches, they're viewed as cursed and non-Christian. Oh, I know. Though I think this will take a little time, I think I will share some stories. On the internet under Hydesville Tithing, we see a very despicable story. Let us read. A 65-year-old wheelchair-bound woman with congestive heart failure was kicked out of her church because she was not paying her tithe, NBC4 reported. Loretta Davis told NBC4's Mike Bowersock she was shocked when she received a letter saying she was no longer considered a member of her church, the Living Word Tabernacle. Davis made an agreement with a church that she would give 10% of her income. Then she became ill and stopped making payments, so the church revoked her membership. Quote, since January 5th, I've been in the hospital 15 times, unquote, Davis said. Quote, I have suffered with cellulitis since I have had the open heart surgery, unquote. Davis is no longer paying the church $60 per month from her $592 per month Social Security check, Bowersock reported. Quote, I have my tithes that I was supposed to pay, but I have not paid them since this has went on, unquote, Davis said. Quote, in the time of Davis's need, they should be caring, supporting, asking what she needs, help her if she needed help, unquote, said Teresa Meeks, who is Davis's daughter. I agree. They shouldn't be asking her for money. 
Quote, I was so hurt on what they did to her, unquote. The church moved out of its building in Waverly earlier this year, and Davis's dismissal has become the talk of the town, Bowersock reported. In a letter to the editor of the local paper, the former pastor said it is true that Davis lost her membership for not paying her tithes. In the same letter, he said Davis was not kicked out of the church for not paying her tithes. The Reverend Paul McClurg, who started the church, said Davis is still welcome to attend church, but is not allowed to be a member. The issue upset Davis's 83-year-old mother so much that she quit the church. The members have been holding services in a Lions Club Hall while waiting to build a new church. There are at least two former members who will not be attending with them. Oh, well, that's despicable. That church could not even help that disabled woman living on a small Social Security check. Can you imagine that? The woman makes $592 a month, became ill, and the pastor is upset because he's not receiving $60 out of the 592 I have a few things I'd like to say to him. Man, it would not matter if she was in tip-top shape. To expect someone to tithe on $592 a month is ridiculous. The fact that she is disabled and became sicker just shows that the pop belly pig pastor is only concerned about money. Couldn't care less about the situations people are in. Those sorry, greedy, mammonite legalists don't even have a thimble of compassion and understanding. Now, at tithe christian slash things dot com we find other testimonies shannon says the following i became a christian about seven years ago i immediately started going to church i really didn't read the bible too much at first i trusted the pastor and thought that i was being taught the truth they passed the plate to collect the tithes and offerings at least three times a week at least three times a week. Well, that's not too bad. Many Pentecostal churches pass the offering plate three to five times per sermon. Yeah, I know. Shannon says this. It was made clear that the tithe was mandatory and the offering was the amount that you gave that was above the tithe. I was taught that if I wanted to please God, I had to tithe. I still remember the first tithing sermon that I heard at the church. Looking back, I can see how pastors manipulate people into tithing. I heard phrases like mature Christians tithe. The obvious implication is that if you're not tithing, you're not a mature Christian. Quote, people who have faith in God tithe, unquote. Again, the implication here is obvious. I distinctly remember the pastor saying with a very judgmental tone that some people don't think they can afford to tithe. I also remember a self-righteous brother in the congregation say, quote, oh, brother, unquote, out of disgust that someone could have such a lack of faith. Of course, there was the twisting of Malachi to scare us into tithing. The whole sermon was based on fear of manipulation. That is the environment I was in. Well, Shannon talks about those who sneer at people that can't afford to tie as, as a lack of faith. No, let's not confuse presumption with faith. Too many people who sit on that fake throne of judgment have not themselves endured serious money problems. Moreover, for every great story of some poor person who tithed and got blessed, there's always another hundred stories of people who gave until they became bankrupt with no blessings while the pastor goes on vacation with their tithes. Oh, I know. Now let's continue with Shannon. I wanted to please God, so I decided I would try to tithe. My husband did not go to church with me at the time and didn't care if I tithed or not. The decision was mine to make. We are a family of four, and at the time, we were living on $20,000 a year. It was a hardship for me to tithe. I would literally have to decide whether to pay the phone bill or to tithe. If I paid the bill, I would feel guilty for robbing God and for my lack of faith. If I tithed, I would just have to pay double the next time the bill came around and rob God again. It was a vicious circle. According to the pastor, I should have had such a blessing poured out that I could not contain it. This was not the case. I was in bondage. Now let's stop here. By the end of this testimony, she said that she found the truth and got far away from these kinds of churches. Well, I'm happy for her. A lot of people don't do that. They're too stupid. Because they don't read the Bible. That woman was in bondage with the words robbing God on a daily basis. DS, you and I know of even worse stories than hers. There's people who have, have to go without eating in order, to, in order to tithe. 
while they hear the words, you are robbing God. The poor need not listen to these words anymore. They need to hear Proverbs 22, verse 22 and 23, which says, Rob not the poor, because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. For the Lord will please their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. That's right. I have been in and have seen others in those predicaments. The vicious circle of never having the money going nowhere but down as you pay your way into heaven and pay your way into good church status leaves many in perpetual bondage. There are those who see the contradictions and after a while hate God because they believe Malachi 3 as being presented correctly by these charlatans. But when people really understand what tithing was in the Old Testament, they stop hating God because they realize that their bond Bondage is not taught in Scripture, but is a fabricated peddling agenda. Now, here is another testimony from someone named Bill. I am not going to read all of it. That will take too long. We will look at the important parts. We read, My wife started going to a First Assembly of God church. She invited me, but I turned her down several times. Bill's a smart guy. I would have turned down Assembly of God not several times, but permanently. Yeah, tell it like it is. Now, the story continues. She kept asking me, and I finally decided to go one Sunday, but I assured her that all they were after was money. Guess what the sermon on that Sunday was about? Money and giving. I told her that I knew it, and I would never come back. A few weeks later, she talked me into going again. This time, it wasn't so bad. I started attending regularly after that. It wasn't long before I learned of a doctrine called tithing. God expected me to give the local church 10% of my income. Everything I had done in the past, I tried to be the best at it, so I wanted to do the best for God in this area too. I had a good job at the time, still do, and it was no problem for me to give 10%. I would always make sure that my wife had taken our tithe money out every payday. I told her we don't want to be robbing God. I also had learned about what great blessings there were for people who tithed. I got so bad and so legalistic that I made my daughter give 10% of everything she got also. I remember one time she got a birthday card in the mail with some money in it. I told her, you make sure you take 10% of that and give it to God. That's God's money. I was in church just about every time the doors were open. I wanted to do the best for God. After attending and tithing for around three years, I started seeing things that I believed to be out of order in the church. This is a pretty sad story. Yeah, the whole organization needs to have an out of order sign at every church entry. (laughs) Well, I know what you mean. Now the story continues. I talked to the leader of that local church and he seemed to agree, but nothing was ever done about it. The more I studied the Bible, the more I began to see that things were not quite right. I think the first event that opened my eyes came when everyone was invited to the yearly budget meeting. This was something that did not even interest me, but for some reason, probably the Holy Spirit's prompting, I decided to go. This was a church in a small town, and they still took in roughly 90000 for the year. They passed out a copy of that year's financial records for everyone to look at while they went over it. I noticed that at least one-third of the money taken in went to pay the pastor's salary, insurance, etc. One-third of it was gone right off the top. I can't remember the exact amounts, but a large chunk was also taken out for maintaining the building, building loan, maintenance, utility bills, etc. Approximately 10,000 went to missions. Who knows how much of it really got to the missionaries if it had to go through the denomination's headquarters. There were a few times that people were helped, but not very many. There was one entry to feed the children for $42. I left the meeting totally grieved. Most of the money that had been taken in was used to support and maintain the building, not to help people. So hungry children received $42. <laughs> Man, you can't even adequately feed one child for $42. What a joke. Isn't that ridiculous? Of course, the pastor probably got more than $42. Yeah, tell me about it. We continue. The final straw happened a couple weeks later while I was leaving the building. The leader was standing at the door shaking people's hands as they left. I was the last one in line, and there was a couple before me. They stopped to talk to the leader. They said something like this. You know, Dave and Sherry really need some help. Dave lost his job. Can we take up a collection for them? This man's first response was, well, I will have to approve that with the board. That stunned me. When did Jesus ever have to get man's approval to feed the hungry? 
The second statement was the, the clincher. He said, they could always go to the food bank. What? I was done with that place. Here is a family in need, and they are told they can go to a food bank. I wonder how much money they had tithed to that place. Now they are in need, and the only hope is a food bank. After leaving that place, First Assembly of God, I tried a few other places out, but most of them were just like that place I had left. I stopped looking and just continued my relationship with God and to study the Bible for myself. I soon discovered the real truth about tithing. It was not required by New Testament believers. It was never money, etc. It really angered me that I was lied to all this time about tithing for their financial gain. I really can't put all the blame on them. I was the one that just took their word for it without studying it for myself. Wow. Actually said to go to a food bank. Right. You don't tell members of your church to go to a food bank? No. And I bet he uttered these words out the side of his neck as he was getting in his rolls to go home to his luxurious house in the hills. How much does that go on? You have families that support their churches faithfully. Then a crisis comes up. They lose their jobs or get sick, and no one wants to help them. People would be better off to put nothing into these churches and save money for their own needs because when everything goes to the pits, they're left hanging in the breeze. The truth of the matter is, if someone runs into financial difficulties, such as a person can't pay the rent or mortgage or feed the family, that person is not obligated to continue giving 10% to any church. No. No, they're not. And 1 Timothy 5, 8, Paul says, But if anyone provide not for his own, and and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. In other words, the first priority is taking care of your own house. How in the world can you take care of the church if you can't even take care of your own house? Let's get our priorities intact here. Well, the problem with the phony imposter tithe collectors is that they will always say that your tithe is required, no matter what your situation is. You can be heading for the street and they'll tell you to tithe. Oh, I know all about it. I have actually been in that situation twice. Well, the truth of the matter is the clergy have grossly misinterpreted Malachi 3, 8 through 12. They have made tithing into something that was never even established in the Old Covenant system of tithing. Even in the Old Testament, God did not require people to tithe on what they did not possess. Let's take a look at this biblical truth. Notice Genesis 28, verses 20 through 22. We read, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you. Take note, this is the first scripture that describes someone giving a tenth or tithe of personal possessions. And there is much to see in this illustration, if we will just read it carefully. Jacob clearly says that if, and the word if is a big little word. Jacob clearly says that if God will do this, and if God will do the other things, then he will give back a tenth. Let us underscore that. Jacob clearly says that if God will do this, and if God will do the other things, then he will give God back a tenth. Well, in other words, if someone was not blessed, they did not tithe, because God does not expect you to give what you don't have. Exactly. Now, since we are talking about Jacob, we must ask, in what way did he tithe, considering that there was no temple or Levitical priesthood? There were actually two different ways that Jacob could tithe to God. Number one, let's read Deuteronomy 12, 6 and 7. And thither you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice in all that you put your hand unto you and your households wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Now, the second way is Deuteronomy 14, 29. Now, note this clearly. There was no Levites in Jacob's day. Nonetheless, there was, quote, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow 
which are within thy gates, and they shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all thy work of thine hand which thou doest. Now, is this how God acknowledged a tithe from Jacob? By Jacob and his family partaking of a portion and thanksgiving to God, and by sharing his fortune with the less fortunate? I would say so. But I can't emphasize it enough. We don't see this principle in modern Christian tithing. We don't see those who have substance helping the poor people in the church. We see rich pastors demanding money from everyone as though giving is unconditional. We see the pastor and the wealthy members forming their own group while they extricate the less fortunate from them. The poorer people feel demoralized and dejected as they live in constant bondage, trying to fit in with people who they deem as Christians, and worse, they feel like they are not going to make it to heaven unless they run the risk of losing their homes, having their, their utilities shut off, or not eating in order to give money to pastors and organizations that don't give two cents about anything other than themselves. Yes, we're getting close to the end of part one of this program, so let's find a few more things. Okay, then let's finalize. Question. What was the tithe in the Old Testament? Let's go to 2 Chronicles 31, 5 and 6. We read, As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the children of Israel and Judah, who dwelt in the cities of Judah, brought the tithe of oxen and sheep, also the tithe of holy things, which were consecrated to the Lord their God they laid in heaps. Now, what was the tithe? Products of the land, products of trees, herds and flocks like usual. Now in Hezekiah's time, new priests and Levites were set up. Did the tithe change? Not at all. Let's go to Nehemiah 10, 37 and 38. To bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine and oil, to the priests, to the storerooms of the house of our God, to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites, for the Levites should receive the tithes and all our farming communities. And the priests, the descendants of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes, and the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. I don't think we can emphasize emphasize it enough. Who was the tithe designated for in Hezekiah's day? We find the answer to that in Nehemiah 12.44. And at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings, the first fruits, and the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities the portion specified by the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who ministered. Notice Nehemiah 13.5. And he prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers, and the offerings for the priests. Wow. Today the Old Testament system of tithing has been recreated into money. The new system of Christian tithing does not look anything like the former system. Today, many Christians are living in bondage to a total farce inculcated by greedy men. Should we support the ministry? Yes. Are we obligated to give 10% along with offerings? No. I think Paul tells us the way we should give. We're going to read 2 Corinthians 8, 10 through 12 and 2 Corinthians 2, 17 from the Living Bible for clarity. Let us read. I want to suggest that you finish what you started to do a year ago, for you are not only the first to propose this idea, but the first to begin doing something about it. Having started the ball rolling so enthusiastically, you should carry this project through to completion just as gladly, giving whatever you can out of whatever you have. Let your enthusiastic idea at the start be equaled by your realistic action now. If you are really eager to give, then it is an important how much you have to give. God wants you to give what you have, not what you haven't. And what does 2 Corinthians 2.17 say? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. I like that. Give what you have, not what you don't have. Mike, there are people out there who have enough money to give 50% of their income to the ministry, and they will still be rich. 
Such people should give money to the cause of ministry and helping the poor. Still yet, there are people out there who are about to lose their homes, can't pay their bills, and they cannot give a dime for anything. The fact of the matter is the Levitical system of tithing does not apply to the church. And very disturbing, the Levitical system of tithing has not been replicated by Christianity, but has been twisted into something foreign to what God established. Now, is it evil for the church to create a system in which finances can be established for the growth of the church and for the functions that Jesus has asked his people to carry out? Not at all. I completely understand why the churches want finances to carry out the work and to exist as bodies. But what is not acceptable is when religious leaders twist the scriptures, specifically the Old Testament tithe, into an incessant yoke of bondage on people to pay or be lost, to pay or be castigated, to pay or be kicked out of the church, to pay even if you can't feed your family, to pay ultimately for the fleshly lusts of world-loving pastors. Now, is this to say that all pastors treat the unbiblical system of Christian tithing as means to get rich? No. There are pastors, though they are enforcing Christian tithing as a biblical law, there are pastors who are not greedy and are just following what they believe. It is apparent that the situation we face in Christendom is pretty complex. Now, on the next program, we are going to cover even more ground on this topic. I say this to the audience. We are not done with this topic. There is still much more to this argument. So until next time, have a good day and study your Bibles. Yes, yes, if only people would remember that little thing called the Bible. We wouldn't have Christians cattle ranched into giving until they're blue in the face and their families are either homeless or dead. If pastors would read their Bibles, they would at least feel guilty for extortionately robbing the poor of the little money that they have under false pretenses. And the false pretense is their interpretation of Malachi 3, verses 8 to 9. They would know that their interpretation is wrong, and that they are criminally robbing people out of fear. Do you know what the definition of robbery is? According to the state of California Penal Code, section 211, robbery is the felonious taking of personal property in the possession of another from his personal or immediate presence and against his will, accomplished by means of force or fear. Think about that for us for a minute. Certainly some people may not want to give 10% to their particular church. And so by the pastor threatening that that person be either thrown out of the church or counted as a non-Christian by God, possibly ending up in hell, the church pastor is effectively accomplishing the tithe giving by means of fear. Think about that. 